presidents are also going to address a very large gathering of business people. I think it's 150 from the US and an equal number, I would imagine, from India, if not more. Uh, and that's, I think, being put together by the US-India Business Council. And they are going to be pushing the Make in India uh, concept, of course, mm -hmm. trying to attract investment and even manufacturing facilities into uh, India from our side. But the question is, what does America really uh, want? Because we have talked about this before, about the question of what is it that corporate America really looks mm. for in India? Because mm. at times you've got conflicting signals. Mm. Obviously, India is seen as one of the hugest, most attractive potential markets in the world with its growing middle class, with its increasing buying capacity, and so on. So that's one, one way in which the US corporate world looks at uh, India. Uh, the other aspect, however, is that They've taken some very tough moves against India, or what has been perceived here as very tough moves. Uh, the, the role of uh, pharma, for example, you know, uh, the, 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 the kind of pressure that's been put by big pharma companies who feel that they have to protect the huge billions of dollars, the huge sums which they have uh, invested in patenting certain drugs and seeing the development of Indian generics mm -hmm. or Indian alternatives at cheaper costs no matter how humanitarian the, mm. uh, the, the use may be intended for, they see it as affecting their commercial uh, interests. Mm. And there have been campaigns you know, to sort of say that their rights should be protected. Similarly on IPR uh, issues. Mm. Uh, you've had, for instance, recently when there's been the contract for getting uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas, from the US, the initial agreement, Gale from our side, envisaged that we would use our ships develop the correct technology for you know, using our shipping for bringing the uh, LNG to India. But the US is now again seeking to say that US ships and US technology, which will not necessarily be transferred, would be used for this. Mm. So again, this kind of conflicts with the make in India, develop in India mm. concept. And the USTR, the US Chamber of Commerce, uh, the curiously named NAMA, which sounds very Indian for some reason, <laughs> maybe because of the association with NAM, mm. the National Association of Manufacturing of America, have all at different times put different kinds of uh, pressures on India and mm. brought allegations of uh, protectionism. I think there's a great deal of double standards there. And, uh, you know, I myself, when I served in the US and I was working on US trade policy, uh, saw how often the grandfather clause was uh, invoked mm -hmm. when we were dealing with GATT issues, mm -hmm. which were the predecessor of WTO. WTO. And uh, whether on um, dumping or, uh, you know, subsidies or on countervailing duties, uh, even on GSP, you know, very arbitrary decisions were taken saying, oh, we've got older pre predating re legislation, so the U.S. can't do this even though we've, we've agreed to this uh, mm -hmm. treaty. Mm -hmm. So. I think the real issue is uh, how do we deal with this paradox, this contradiction, you know? I mean, obviously there's a certain section of business and investment in both countries that see each other as very, very attractive partners. Mm. Uh, the US is a very powerful and a very economically powerful country. If we want major investments, the US has to come in, particularly into infrastructure <coughs> development and so on and so forth. But how do we reconcile these paradoxes of at the same time, the need, you know, sort of moves to reach out and at the same time moves to sort of see that things are done only on the terms that the U.S. would like. Yeah, absolutely. Because, and you're very right, uh, because essentially the U.S. corporates uh, and generally not just corporates but across the United States First and foremost, it's not just in business or on any issue, security or any issue, irrespective of what we have said earlier, they will look after their own interests. That has to be. And their interests would be the, what is going to be affect their bottom line. And uh, some of them uh, have uh, earlier, uh, not, uh, but the, some of them have shown, you know, for instance, you mentioned pharmaceuticals, for instance. Let me take pharmaceuticals. 
pharmaceuticals, you had basically this campaign is being led by Pfizer, mm -hmm. to be frank with you. Uh, they have mobilized support because they have of their particular business model, because of the massive investments they make into innovation in terms of patents. You know, unlike some other companies which put in hundreds of uh, millions, these people put in sometimes billions. So their stakehold, so they don't want patents to, you know, they want patents to have a longer shelf life because of the amount of investments they put in. So what they see and what we have done extremely successfully is in generics mm. after some time, and we are very competitive. So they have accepted that for the Indian market. Mm -hmm. But they see this and what we have done very successfully in combating pandemics like in South Africa, HIV AIDS and all that, yeah. our companies have done that. So what they see is that it's not just the Indian market, but what we are doing is affecting the global market and their competition. So they are reacting in a particular way. But a lot of it, I'll tell you also, is, so, is that these pharmaceutical companies are reacting that way. But while they are reacting in terms of market access, and therefore it's affecting our market access, even having said that, and saying that they are acting in, in a, I would say, in a very unethical manner, using all tactics, uh, and which is, uh, which is the, it's certain things which are unacceptable. But having said that, the US is still the most accessible market we have compared to any other country elsewhere. I've tried unsuccessfully to get our pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. into Russia, mm -hmm. elsewhere. They're much more restrictive, and today, even today, they're more than 25% of all our pharmaceuticals go to that country. Africa, fortunately, is catching up for the same reasons. I hope we'll be able to diversify our markets. But today, in spite of all its barriers, it is the most accessible. accessible. Mm -hmm. Number one. Number two is, uh, I'll relate this to IPR, you know, in a, and please tell me when I'm, if I'm forgetting certain things, because you asked a lot of questions, uh, and, uh, or if I'm going off the wrong track. Uh, what, uh, you know, let's say on IPR, what we are doing rightly, we are reviewing our IPR policies right now. As you know, mm -hmm. this is a, an exercise which we are undertaking, which is a good thing. Uh, but on pharmaceuticals, in terms of you know providing healthcare, affordable healthcare, is a prime concern and it's a vital concern which on which we should not compromise. I am absolutely clear. Whatever your objectives, so we'll have to ensure that. And we'll have to tailor our policies according to that. But having said that, IPR should not be focused only in defense, in a defensive posture, in terms of what do you tell, you know, the WTO, or what do we tell them? How do we counter it in terms of, uh, you know, the U.S. arguments? Because that will be counterproductive. <coughs> Why? Because IPR generally should also be that. Innovation is an American strength, but hopefully it's not going to be a monopoly. Our presumption should not be that India will be forever an importer, that India will be forever a recipient. Whether it's in climate change, we say we should demand that they should give us technology, but hopefully we will not be permanently, whether it's an environmental technology, whether it is chemicals, whether it is discovery of new drugs, whether it is, uh, you know, across the board, you know, in what's happening in technology area, every area there's innovation. We should create, uh, we should not go on the presumption that you're going to be permanent recipients. Mm -hmm. You'll be contributors, partners, and also be able to partners, and partners, good partners are the ones who contribute as much on both sides. As you know, you know that old saying, I think it was Vidya Sagar. Mm -hmm. He's saying, why is that person avoiding me? I don't remember having done him a favor. <laughs> because the best way to ruin even the best friendship is to do a favor which you know the other person cannot return. Yeah. So best partnership is to work both ways. So our IPR policy also should be to reward innovation. Why is it that in so many areas, why are people successful in the United States? It's the same people who cannot succeed here. Mm -hmm. Because they, why are people, even today as we are speaking, mm -hmm. and I've seen this for years since I was in atomic energy, I've seen this elsewhere also, Youngsters just going there to register their patents. Why don't they register in India? Mm -hmm. So we should create an ambiance mm -hmm. for innovation, for creativity. And it's across the board, not just companies, mm -hmm. not just laboratories, not, it should be in universities. 
Universities should be the incubators of innovation. So across the board, and that should be the debate as to how you bring it out. And we have done it in terms of islands. We have done it in ISRO in Bangalore. We have done it atomic, and you have seen it. But you can't remain, you can't have these islands. We have to make this on a national basis. And therefore, what you're saying, make in India, not just make in India, it should be make, made by India. Mm -hmm. There's a difference in that. So don't just mass produce here, locate your plants here. We should have that kind of partnership. It should be a combination of all of that. And basically, linking yourself with the global value chain, because we are obsessed with, and obsessed with, you know, like for instance, trade, trade barriers, WTO, mm -hmm. all that is old hat, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Today, it's global chains. What we were, the debates, we are using the same rhetoric as in the 1990s. Again, as you know, there was mm -hmm. opposition from our industry when we opened up, the Bombay Club and so on and so forth. But at that time, it was 19% or less. 18% of our GDP was trade. Today, half our GDP is trade. Mm -hmm. And so we are talking of maritime security. There it comes in also because Indian Ocean is important because 90% uh, by volume you know, goes to the Indian Ocean and 69% uh, uh, by value. But there again, we have to, what we'd say, we are WTO compliant. That is global minimum standards. What we should do is a global best standard, highest standard. So we should, we'll have to have a change there. Then you mentioned about, uh, like for instance, very relevant in Bangalore, and I appreciate fully the concerns uh, on this H1B, uh, this, these visas, you know, yeah. L1 and yeah. so on and so forth, you know, the fees getting increased. Uh, lots of things happening under the immigration. You know, one is the Border Security Act and the, uh, some other provisions in a draft bill which is not uh, adopted and I think it's unlikely to be adopted. But nonetheless, uh, very frankly, I'll tell you that is also led by uh, IBM. Mm -hmm. And why IBM? Because IBM had a huge tax issue. They got clobbered with a, uh, you know, I mean, a very large tax burden, which was, un which everyone, I think later on people will recognize it was un unreasonable. But whatever it was, it had nothing to do with their, uh, with. so they said, all right, we are being made to pay a price, we'll make other people pay a price. So it's, the thing started off there. But generally, the issues there are such that politically it's very difficult to convince people because in the United States, they believe rightly or wrongly that anyone whether you are a US citizen or you are a foreign citizen, whether you are uh, irrespective of your race, in nationality, uh, gender, you should equal work, equal pay. Rightly or wrongly, they believe that. So if you have a pay differential which is very sharp, it creates a bit of a problem for them. And all the more so, this has got, uh, 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 you know, with the, 2008 financial crisis. They are recovering very well. It's incredible. The recovery, 5% quarterly growth rate is incredibly high. But the recovery is not reflected in what the earnings of an average citizen. It's only the, you know, in Wall Street and others, in the financial sector, who are making massive bonuses, CEO price. Mm -hmm. So there is a resentment there also. So you have this, and this is not a US phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon of equality. That means, are the reforms, or whatever you're doing, are the, whatever policies you're following, is it bene benefiting the, what they call the average Joe? Is it benefiting the common person? Or is it benefiting a minuscule number of people? So for whatever reason, they have this thing about equal work, equal pay, and that is what the corporations follow also, US corporations follow it. So when they say, if some foreign corporations are doing something, you know, it's a little bit different. So there are complex issues which are, we'll have to sell it in a proper manner and also review our business model. That I, I, this is not entirely unexpected because I told some of our companies even at that time that look, it's all right for today but you'll have to review it over a period of time. So you say how long it's going to take. Is it going to take you five years, 10 years, 20 years? Give some period but you'll have to come and you know, meet some of the concerns. There's another thing about withholding tax, mm -hmm. what they call the so-called totalization agreement. Yeah. I think we got a very reasonable case. But so far, let me tell you, and I'll be very frank with you, irrespective of discussions which are going on, I don't see this happening immediately. But of course, it can happen you know, if they take a political decision and they are able to sell it in Congress. Why? I'll tell you why. 
Uh, so it is certainly not impossible, but it's difficult because so far the US has signed these agreements only with OECD countries. Mm. There's not one OECD country, I mean not one non-OECD country, number one. Number two, even with the OECD country like Mexico, which is their nearest neighbor, also their immediate neighbor and vitally important to them politically. It's also their NAFTA, you know, in the, that's, sorry, uh, North uh, America, Amer America uh, uh, free trade agreement, free trade agreement, NAFTA. They are the NAFTA partners. In spite of that, they signed it more or less the time when I was there, 2004. Do you know what? Till today, they have not implemented it. And I'm telling you, you talk, we gather here today, uh, you can gather 10 years from now, I'm telling you, they won't, will not implement it. So that is the reality. Uh, what other something I forgot? Well, I, I think we, we did discuss earlier today, and I think this is relevant since we also mm. mentioned visas as a barrier. Yeah. You know, we talked about the global entry program. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and we said that if uh, there is an expectation on mm. our side mm. that India would be included under the global entry program, it simply means that certain people who meet certain criteria from India would have much easier access when they wanted mm. to go to the US and would get a kind of fast track yeah, treatment. Yeah. And uh, I think there's, there's an expectation that there'll be uh, some movement both on the visas and on that. And that was mentioned as one of the concerns of uh, Bangalore-based companies, for instance. No, absolutely. No, there's know? no problem there. Yeah. But there again, there again, it will be difficult to say mm. that what, that Indian citizens will not go through the same procedures as American citizens. Mm. That, of course. No, mm. but I'll tell you why. Because mm -hmm. the checks are pretty intrusive. Mm. You know, they'll go into income tax, they'll go a lot of, you know, because all these things are linked up. You know, you have been dealing with Mm -hmm. Counterterrorism and other things. As it, so you, you know the whole situation. So similarly, you know, for instance, all these issues. What we have to look at is, in spite of, and if you take all these sectors, one very important aspect I want to mention to you. Uh, what they have done, you know, this NAMA, as you said, the National mm -hmm. Association of Manufacturers and all that. I think it was very poor taste. The type of demonstrations they had, the type of mobilization they did. It was a very shrill campaign. It was in very poor taste. But let me tell you that the concerns they are voicing are not US concerns. Mm -hmm. We talked just now about the IPR pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. But the most affected companies have been Bayer. The European companies. That is, uh, uh, and Novartis. Novartis, I think, is uh, Swiss. Swiss. And Bayer is, I think, German. But so even on taxation, I said, you know, somebody got it. But, you know, I mean, Vodafone is not a US company. So what I'm saying is some of these concerns or all these concerns which are being expressed by them, every single one of them is across the board. Like Russia had huge problems with that. They have invoked it. They might, you know, they said you sort it out. We're not, not interested in what your Supreme Court does. But you have the Supreme Court has no business it's a straightforward violation of the uh, of the uh, uh, investment uh, treaty. protection yeah. uh, treaty oh, which you uh, have. The, the, yeah. It was so. It is not just the U.S. They are acting as a megaphone, but it's across the board, not just Russia, several West European countries, in different parts of the world. So it is not exclusively. It comes out as a new issue. For instance, WTO. WTO was not just the U, a U.S. issue. WTO on trade facilitation, you didn't have any, whom did you have on your side? Honestly, you had Cuba and Venezuela. <laughs> no, honestly. Yeah. So you had, there were 160 countries. So, but we have made it into a US issue. So we have to recognize this, that certain things are un unacceptable, but they're not peculiarly American. Well, you know, we have a long list of issues which we thought we would be able to discuss, <laughs> and I would like to, um, you know, perform my role as partially as the moderator and try to wind up